Michael Wheatley is a 24-year-old male client who presents to the emergency department, or ED, with muscle cramps in both legs, joint pain in his knees, hips, shoulders, and wrists, as well as lethargy and nausea. He mentions that he was recently diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, for which he received his first dose of chemotherapy in an outpatient oncology clinic yesterday. The ED physician orders IV fluids at a rate of 200 milliliters per hour and admits Michael to the inpatient oncology unit for further evaluation and treatment. Tumor lysis syndrome, or TLS, is an oncologic emergency that's characterized by severe metabolic and electrolyte abnormalities. This most often occurs as a complication during treatment of hematological malignancies, like leukemia and lymphoma, with chemotherapeutic medications that rapidly kill large numbers of tumor cells. Rarely, TLS can also occur spontaneously with tumors that have a high proliferative rate or a large tumor burden prior to any treatment. Regardless, the end result is a massive release of intracellular contents during lysis of tumor cells into the bloodstream. This results in hyperkalemia, which can interfere with electrical activity in the heart, brain, and nerves. In addition, there's hyperuricemia, and the excess uric acid can form crystals that deposit in the tiny kidney tubules, resulting in acute kidney injury. Finally, there's hyperphosphatemia, and the excess phosphate can bind to the calcium in the blood, forming a complex, leading to hypocalcemia, which can also interfere with electrical activity in the heart, brain, and nerves. Moreover, these phosphate-calcium complexes can also form crystals that deposit in the kidney tubules, contributing to the development of acute kidney injury. Now, there are some factors that may put the client at risk of TLS, such as older age and having a large tumor burden, which can be evidenced by the presence of a very high white blood cell count, and high lactate dehydrogenase, or LDH, as well as bone marrow involvement by the malignancy. Other risk factors include having an underlying renal disease that reduces urinary output thus promoting the precipitation of uric acid, or phosphate calcium crystals, in the renal tubules. Finally, the risk of TLS is also higher with the use of substances that increase the uric acid levels in blood, such as alcohol and medications like thiazide diuretics or levodopa. Now, symptoms of TLS include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, as well as muscle cramps or twitches, often associated with weakness, numbness, and tingling. In addition, clients may experience confusion, irritability, delirium, and seizures. An important complication of TLS is acute kidney injury, which typically presents with oliguria, or a decreased urine output. Finally, clients may experience arrhythmias, which can lead to palpitations and syncope. If not treated, TLS can cause sudden cardiac death. Now, diagnosis of TLS begins with history and clinical findings. Upon lab tests, a complete metabolic panel will be reflective of electrolyte imbalance, typically showing hyperkalemia, hyperuricemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia. In addition, LDH is typically increased. Other diagnostic tests include kidney function tests, which typically show increased serum creatinine and blood urea nitrogen, or BUN, as well as a urinalysis, which usually reveals the presence of uric acid crystals in urine. Finally, an electrocardiography, or ECG, can be done to assess for cardiac complications. Treatment of TLS also involves close monitoring of electrolyte levels, urine output, and cardiac function. Treatment starts with intravenous isotonic fluids to help correct the electrolyte's abnormalities. In addition, hyperkalemia can be managed with IV insulin and dextrose, which helps move some of the excess potassium to the inside of the cells and decreases its level in the blood, or with polystyrene sulfonate or k 
if the potassium levels are lower than 6.5 milliequivalents per liter and cardiac symptoms are absent. Hyperphosphatemia can be treated with IV fluids. Phosphate binding agents such as aluminum hydroxide and dietary restriction of phosphate, whereas hypocalcemia usually resolves with the management of hyperphosphatemia. Hyperuricemia can be managed with medications like allopurinol, which decreases the production of uric acid, or with rasburicase, which breaks down uric acid to be easily excreted by the kidneys. If the level of potassium phosphate or uric acid is too high, urgent hemodialysis might be needed. Finally, TLS can be prevented by taking certain measures before starting chemotherapy, such as aggressive intravenous hydration, as well as medications to prevent hyperuricemia, like allopurinol or rasburicase. Let's get back to assess our client, Michael. When you ask him how he's feeling, he states he's been having intense muscle cramping and joint pain since the previous night, and he's been nauseous and lethargic. When asked about his recent voiding pattern, if there is any blood present in his urine, and how often he has been drinking fluids in the last 24 hours, he says that he has been needing to use the bathroom less than usual, only about twice daily, because he has not been able to tolerate eating or drinking due to feeling nauseated. He also says he has not noticed any blood in his urine. Upon examination, his lungs are clear to auscultation, and he denies shortness of breath. His vital signs are temperature 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, heart rate 98 beats per minute, respirations 18 breaths per minute, blood pressure 130 over 80 millimeters of mercury, Oxygen saturation, 94% on room air. And he rates his flank and muscle pain a 6 out of 10. Bowel sounds are present in all four quadrants. His kidney function tests revealed BUN, 50 mg per deciliter, serum creatinine, 4.9 mg per deciliter, and uric acid, 19 mg per deciliter. Serum electrolytes are potassium, 6.0 milliequivalents per liter, phosphate, 7.9 mg per deciliter, and calcium, 6.1 mg per deciliter. An electrocardiogram, or ECG, is completed and reveals tall, peaked T waves, a shortened QT interval, and ST segment depression. You notify the attending physician of your assessment findings and collaborate on the plan of care for Michael. Based on the assessment data you have collected, your nursing diagnoses include risk for decreased cardiac tissue perfusion related to abnormal electrolyte levels, risk for imbalanced fluid volume related to damage to renal tubules, pain related to the effects of imbalanced electrolytes on muscle contraction, nausea related to metabolic derangements, and readiness for enhanced knowledge related to the prevention and treatment of TLS. Now that you've created nursing diagnoses, you plan with Michael and the healthcare team to achieve some important goals. Throughout your shift, Michael's heart rhythm will be regular, heart and cardiac perfusion will be adequate. He will maintain an adequate fluid balance. His pain will be managed to his stated level of tolerance of 3 out of 10. His nausea will be controlled. And finally, he will verbalize an understanding of his treatment plan and preventative measures to decrease the risk of TLS. Now that you've established goals with Michael, you coordinate care with the healthcare team to implement the plan of care. First, continuous ECG monitoring is initiated, and Michael will continue the IV fluids at an infusion rate of 200 milliliters per hour to promote diuresis and keep urinary output between 150 to 200 milliliters per hour. You delegate measuring intake and output to the nursing assistant. Then, you administer these ordered IV medications. Regular insulin plus 50% dextrose, calcium gluconate, rasburicase, ondansetron, and hydromorphone. While you administer the medications, you teach him about how the tumor cells killed by the chemotherapy caused an imbalance in his body's metabolism, and that each of the medications are aimed at restoring balance. Hourly vital signs are ordered, and electrolytes will be monitored every four hours.
Later, when Michael is feeling better, you review the importance of staying well hydrated while he's being treated for his non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and to adhere to a low potassium and low phosphorus diet by avoiding certain foods, such as high-fat dairy, certain seafoods and meats, as well as carbonated beverages, bananas, and potatoes. You let him know that you have asked the dietitian to visit him before discharge to go over a diet plan to meet his nutritional needs while reducing the risk of complications of TLS. Throughout your shift, you closely monitor Michael's response to treatment, and you will immediately report to the attending physician any changes that could indicate a worsening condition, including arrhythmias, palpitations, shortness of breath, muscle twitching, changes in mental status, or decreased urine output. It is near the end of your shift and it is time to evaluate how Michael is doing. His current vital signs are blood pressure 126 over 78 millimeters of mercury, temperature 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit or 37 degrees Celsius, respiration rate 16 breaths per minute, oxygen saturation 94% on room air. The ECG monitor shows normal sinus rhythm and a heart rate of 85 beats per minute and there has been no further evidence of cardiac arrhythmias throughout your shift. Michael reports a decrease in joint and flank pain, rating it a 2 out of 10. He has maintained an hourly urine output of 150 milliliters per hour, and his urine appears clear and yellow with no evidence of hematuria. His latest lab results appear to be trending in the right direction. Potassium at 5.3 milliequivalents per liter, phosphate 6.6 .6 milligrams per deciliter, calcium at 7.2 milligrams per deciliter, BUN 45 milligrams per deciliter, serum creatinine 4.2 milligrams per deciliter, and uric acid 14 milligrams per deciliter. Michael remains alert and oriented. He states he is feeling less nauseous and he has begun to take PO fluids. He tells you he recognizes the importance of adequate hydration and adjusting his diet, and he's looking forward to talking to the dietitian. You are happy to see that Michael's condition has started to improve. Michael will continue to be monitored closely while his electrolyte imbalances are stabilized so he can safely be discharged home. All right, as a quick recap, Tumor lysis syndrome, or TLS, is an oncologic emergency that's characterized by severe metabolic and electrolyte abnormalities. It most often occurs as a complication during treatment of hematological malignancies with chemotherapeutic medications that rapidly kill large numbers of tumor cells. Your assessment revealed that Michael was experiencing muscle cramps, joint and flank pain, oliguria, nausea, abnormal kidney function tests, and abnormal metabolic panel results. Your nursing diagnoses were risk for decreased cardiac tissue perfusion, risk for imbalanced fluid volume, pain, nausea, and readiness for enhanced knowledge. The goals you identified when planning care for Michael included maintaining cardiac perfusion, maintaining fluid balance, controlling pain and nausea, and increasing his understanding of the prevention and treatment of TLS. Along with the healthcare team, you work to implement actions to achieve the goals of the plan of care for Michael. Prior to Michael's discharge, you and the healthcare team will continue to evaluate if those goals have been met. Helping current and future clinicians focus, learn, retain, and thrive. Learn more.